There was a man who loved a woman dearly. I would die for you, he professed to her. The man asked for her hand in marriage and shortly after she agreed, a war broke out. The young man was called up. As he departed, he asked that she wait for him until he returned. Please keep yourself as I will, said the man to his fiancee. I will, she promised. You have been a saving grace and I pledge myself to you. The days turned into months, the months into years. The enemy invaded the country and established a new reign. Life was very different and the woman began to change as well. The fiance wrote her a very long love letter detailing his affection for her and also reiterating to her that he would indeed return. As time passed, she read the letter less frequently. She tried to hold on to his words. He had told her that when the war came, it would progressively get worse before it got better. Stay vigilant, my love, and no matter what, never accept their ways or their propaganda, he had said before departing. But before long, the woman had indeed changed. She had fallen for the propaganda and followed the ways of the invaders. She lost empathy. When people were taken prisoner and killed, she no longer reacted. She even gave herself freely to their soldiers. They whined her and dined her and she adopted to their way of life so convincingly that she could easily be mistaken for one of them. All the while, she still wore the ring of her fiance. The day came as he had promised. There was a great battle in the sky and his war plane descended. And even though it was pitch black at midnight, his first act was to rush to her home to collect her. When he arrived, he banged on the door and yelled, it is I, my beloved, come to marry you as I promised. There was no answer. Whispers and the sound of feet running about the house. Men's voices could be heard from the inside. Two of her would-be bridesmaids slowly opened the door. The drunken men were shoved away into a room. They had hurriedly tried to slide her dress on, but it had been balled up and tossed in the attic. Both dust and dirt had turned it from pure white to gray. Her hair was disheveled. The glow was gone from her eyes. Her makeup was smeared and she even smelled of alcohol. There he was, her prince, her beloved, standing tall in the doorway with tears in his eyes. She ran away from him and locked herself in her room. And before long, he too disappeared from the doorway. Why didn't you talk to him? One of the bridesmaids said as she shook her. I can't let him see me like this. I want to talk to you this morning from the title. I can't let him see me like this. The bride, of course, in the story is the church. And in the midst of a spiritual war that I characterize as a world war, she has fallen into the company of the enemy. She has indulged in the sin of the world until she no longer looks the same, she is no longer the virtuous woman of Proverbs. She has given herself to the enemy and his minions. The bridegroom that is Christ had warned her of his coming in his long love letter. And that love letter, of course, beloved, is the Bible. All the way back to the Old Testament, prophets had foretold of this day. And because he did not come when expected, but came instead as a thief in the night, he catches the church unaware. The church is a mess. And because we still bear the name Christian, we are still wearing his ring. But we can't boast of being spot free with no wrinkle, can we? Because we balled up our salvation, our holiness, and we tossed it into the attic until it is no longer pure white, but it has turned Right. 
And woe unto us when he should crack the sky that we are not ready and we cry. I don't want him to see me like this for then it will be too late. The text this morning comes from the book of Matthew chapter 25, Matthew 25, and I'll only be using verses five and six, Matthew 25 verses five through six. If you have your mobile phone, please scroll to it. If you have the app, if you have your Bible, I'd like for you to mark it. I want you to go back and spend some time ruminating on this particular text. It reads like this. It says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, there was a cry made, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. This week in Bible study, we pondered the notion as to whether or not evil was prevailing. And the unfortunate answer is, Indeed it is. There are many people that are praying for God's judgment as we watch the proliferation of evil in the earth. It is admittedly psychologically and emotionally fatiguing. I for one am tired of death. I'm tired of violence, the loss of life and the unwillingness of creation to respect God's spirit in others is not only heartbreaking, but it's starting to anger me. People are wantonly killing the vulnerable and it occurs so frequently that as we said in Bible study this week, we have become desensitized to it. Newscasters move from the death of a child to sports without flinching. The condition of the world is growing worse by the minute. I shared statistics that indicated that even in the midst of COVID, even as we were quarantined to our homes, the death rate rose 25% in the United States during 2020. Already in 2021, there have been 108 mass shootings. There is a callousness operating in humanity such that we no longer value life. And what about the church? The church itself is witnessing a season of exposure where those who have been called to minister through song, those that have been called as preachers and teachers, even those that are leaders of apostolic assemblages are having their sin exposed. The world is ridiculing the church. The name of God is being blasphemed because of Christians. And we have decided that in the midst of a spiritual warfare, we will cower and hide in our bunkers. We aren't even coming to church when church is made available. Technology has grown to the extent that a person can give their offering through their smartphone. Entire church services can now be uploaded to websites. So that thing we used to call church growth is non-existent. Congregations are getting older all the while. There are cries of church hurts by middle-aged Christians and there's the absence of children in church along with millennials believing in ecumenism and universalism and chematism and Egyptology and black Hebrew Israelism. The Bible and the concept of sin is under attack inside of divinity schools. Theologians are openly doubting whether or not God's word is still fallible. There is a battle between religiosity and spirituality. There is child molestation still being committed by priests. There is adultery and fornication and homosexuality committed by pastors with members of their congregation and church secretaries and even pastors with other pastors. The preaching of prosperity gospels that pads the pockets and purchase planes for holy men at the expense of single mothers. Did I forget to mention the church hopping, the title chasing, the backbiting, the backstabbing, the backsliding, the lying, the stealing, the gossip, the innuendo, the hatred, the jealousy, the envy, the strife, the unforgiveness, judgment that goes on inside of the threshold of the temple gates, the cussing and the lusting that goes on in pastor studies before the word is to go forth, all indicate to me that the bride of Christ has fallen asleep. Go ahead, go ahead. We aren't working. We're doing what the young folks say. We are staying out of the way. 
We're drinking more water and minding our business is what we say. But all around us, that little buffer of holiness where we think that the world can infringe upon is getting smaller and smaller. Evil is claiming young lives, unsaved lives. And if you think you can stay out of the way because you're innocent, you are sadly mistaken. Just last week, there was a 12-year-old with his family inside of McDonald's in Pittsburgh who was stabbed in the neck and killed by a random stranger. We have to be active in our petition to stop evil. We must be active in prayer when we see and hear about violence and death in our world. We must make the introduction to Christ and then we can get out of the way. You see, we've got it backwards. We want people to get saved first and then we want to police their salvation and tell them what to do. Let me give you these points because I, I know I'm touching on some things that you don't want to hear about. First thing is, we thought this day would never come. We thought this day would never come. The text says, while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. I want to focus here on the word tarried. You see, we've gotten lulled into a state of complacency because we've not been able to predict the day nor the hour. We stand gazing, wondering when the hour will be. Peter and Paul both did the same thing. They preached fervently that the kingdom of heaven was upon us because they believed that they would see the coming of Christ during their lifetimes. And they were passionate about it because they didn't want those that they called their beloved to miss the boat called Christ. But generation after generation has seen the wickedness of the land grow and proliferate. And now we thought, eh, I don't know if he's coming back during my lifetime. But then there are those of us that expect it at any hour. That it could be any day now. Well, when Christ's coming has tarried, people became relaxed. They relaxed their walk. They begin to break covenant. They begin to explain the little things away. And then sin became full grown. The earth is no longer subdued. In fact, it rules man. Have you ever heard the saying that he is now a product of his environment? That's how they explain the savagery that I spoke of earlier. Man is a product of his environment. We speak of men controlling their own destiny as it is some grand achievement or it's an anomaly when the truth is his destiny was divinely written and we have abandoned the script. So now man is self-destructive, self-loathing, self-abasing to the extent that the world tells him this. They said, love yourself. Be hedonistic. Do what feels good. Live your best life. Don't worry about other people. And we drank the punch. But as I recall it, God gave us strict commandments relative to our charge in the earth. He told us to love him with all of our mind, heart, body, and soul. And then he says the second command is as the first, which is to love thy neighbors as you love yourselves. Take the land and have dominion over it. He used the word Barak, which in Hebrew means to be blessed, which also means to multiply. But we have turned against even that. As opposed to multiplying, beloved, we are destroying. As opposed to dominion. We are very much at the whim of the earth and the God of this world. Our excuse is... Simple. While the cat's away, the mice will play. We've lost the urgency of the call on our lives. To say that Christ will never come during our lifetime is to say that God has abandoned the throne and that he will never judge. Where will you be found when he does return? Will he catch you headed to in the act of or leaving the scene of your favorite sin? Oh, but you say, I don't want him to see me like that. But you better act as though it could be at any moment as opposed to trying to discern the hour. The second thing I want to show you is we haven't made any arrangements. We haven't made any arrangements. I want to focus on the word slumbered and slept. If we look at who slumbered and slept, it says all. 
The theological context demonstrates that Jesus meant those that were awaiting his return and those that had grown weary in waiting. Both good and bad Christians. So what does it mean? It means that if you aren't working, you need to get to work. And if you are working, you're not doing as much as you could be doing. We have been exceedingly slothful. When we are asked to show our works, we are quick to proffer that it's not our works that warrant salvation. Yeah, but it is your works that will lead others to salvation. So again, I ask, where are your works? We haven't been doing what God called us to do. We have become completely disinterested with the goings on of the world and we hide behind the notion that we are separate from the world. Well, if that's the case, if you are truly called apart, if you're truly separate from the world, then tell me how I can discern the two. Stop sleeping with the world. Stop acting like the world. Stop breaking covenant with God when it's convenient to cheat with the world. Oh, I don't want him to see me like this. Our laboring is about evangelism and proselytizing. If you don't tell people about Jesus, then who's supposed to do it? If you don't invite people to church or to Bible study, then how will they hear? If you don't show people the love of Christ, then from whence will come their encounter with compassion and agape love? I get it. There's a lot going on and the world is a dangerous place. But do you already fear professing Christ openly? See, because as I understand it, it's going to get worse. He says, he that denies me openly, him will I deny before my father. He that professes me openly, him will I profess before my father. We are already behaving like the prophecy of Christian persecution is at hand. Well, I came to tell you this morning, if you look at scripture, you ain't seen nothing yet. You better work while it's still yet day. Number three. We aren't dressed for the occasion. Text says, behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. But we aren't dressed for the occasion. Are you prepared to meet Jesus? Or do you have to get ready? I used to love when the old folks say, listen here, boy, I, I ain't got to go get ready. I'm already ready. Are you dressed in the raiment of righteousness? Many of us are not prepared for the occasion. We're not dressed for the occasion. In one area, we have blood on our hands that is unconfessed sin. Many of us have a spot here and a wrinkle there because we haven't forgiven old transgressions. We're still waiting for an apology, holding a grudge. Many of us have spiritually unkempt hair because we haven't put on the mind of Christ. We are still operating in the flesh. Many of us have on a lot of makeup trying to cover up some old scars that never quite healed. Some may even look like clowns as opposed to brides because you continue to try to wear shoes that are too big. You keep falling down because you're operating in roles that aren't yours instead of doing what God called you to do. Are you dressed for the occasion? Are you ready to see him as he is Face to face. You see when Jesus returns. And you stand before him. Will you truly be prepared for judgment? We see the evil in the world. And we are praying. For God's judgment. But I want to tell you like my grandmother used to say. Be careful. What you ask for. We want God to vindicate his name when it's slandered. We want God to right all of the wrongs in the earth, especially those that have been committed against us. But we fail to understand that is when he shows up, many of us will be caught not fully dressed, not prepared for the occasion. Many of our loved ones, many of our friends who don't know Christ are not prepared for the occasion, but we continue to pray for judgment. Be careful what it is, beloved, that you ask for. I need you to understand something this morning. The reason that Jesus is tearing is not because he is disinterested in justice. 
It is because he is giving the unsaved an opportunity to hear and be saved. And in that same time, the enemy is working vigilantly to steal every soul that he can. And at the same time, you and I have been in the house staying out of the way. He's found a way to shame us. He's even found a way to make us afraid. But how can the unsaved, those that stand in the eye of the storm of judgment, ever come to avoid eternal death if they never hear our testimony? If you never tell of his goodness... If you never tell them how he brought you from a mighty long way. If you never tell them how you made it over. If you never tell them that I was once blind but now I see. How can they be ready if you never tell them how he brought you out of the muck and the miry clay. That he picked you up and turned you around. That he placed your feet on solid ground. That late in the midnight hour God can turn it around that he's been even better to you than you know how to be to yourself that he's a friend to the friendless one that sticks closer than any brother how can they know that there's something about the name Jesus how, how can they overcome if there's no word of your testimony you've got to get up you've got to get back to work wake up from your slumber testify of his goodness tell them who he is. Let your light so shine before men. Get dressed for the occasion for the bridegroom cometh. The hour is at hand. The kingdom of heaven has come near you. Wash your hands, Blackwell. Press your dress. Open your mouth. Confess your vows. Stop running from the enemy. Stop hiding from evil. Speak to it in the name of Jesus and by the power of the Holy Spirit and stop it dead in its tracks. Summon the warring angels of God to come and fight alongside of us. The bridegroom cometh. The bridegroom cometh. Make your election sure because I'm certain that you don't want him to see us like this. God bless you this morning.